Uh, tonight we have Wayne Feifel from the Maryland Fire Investigation Unit. He's been in there for three years. He shortly <coughs> broadened his horizon by leaving the unit to learn new skills in the fire brigade. He's going to come back and leave from time to time, he tells me. He gets a lot of work at a very busy unit. Tonight he's going to, uh, his, he has a, I'll let him talk in depth about it, but from what I understand, he has a license to operate the, um, the drug, <coughs> which is a new, gives you a new dimension in photography to get a complete overview of the fire scene. And I'm sure Wayne will explain that more into depth. So, Wayne, thanks, Dave. Uh, this is firstly, the reason the uniform is that our media unit contacted me today and they want to explore it. So, the unit takes some photos and um, no, it's seeing how love the unit. we're taking it. <laughs> You're just taking it, taking it further. Very, very great. great. Especially that's worry. Fine. Don't worry, we haven't, been, haven't got the presentation done yet, so that's the reason I'm dressed up in the suit. Um, if you have knowledge of this, I am not an expert. I've been flying for a little while, <laughs> so yeah, trust me, enough. if you know more than I, I'm happy. We've got a fellow here who runs his own pilot company, drone company, he tells me earlier, so I'm really going to be under the test. <laughs> so, remote pilot aircraft systems, or RPAS is what they're known as, unmanned aerial vehicles, drones, or as I said, is a new toy for the kids, because a lot of people just buying this toys for the kids. Can you see? Yep, yeah. yeah. okay. Um, so, I'll give you my experience. Now, um, Fire and Rescue have got six qualified controllers. I call them controllers. Uh, CASA calls us pilots. I'm not a pilot. I, I'm a controller. I can play with a toy. So we're six of us. And one of the things from Fire Investigation, we thought this is going to be a great tool for us. So uh, in the first instance, we had enough money to train six people. And because I was the lucky one, I've been doing it. We are going to train more, but it comes down to budgets. When Michael asked me to do this, he said, "Look, talk about the good and the bad. And I thought, well, uh, the good, the bad, and the ugly, because these can, things can go ugly. So, um, call them what you like. In essence, it's a flying camera. That's what it is. It's just a camera in the sky. It's the ability to take footage uh, or photos that are in place that you can't get to. Um, I always take footage because I can take a photo from that footage. It's very hard to look at a little screen and say, is that the perfect photo? Mm. Have I got the angle right? Fly around, capture it, and then download that one shot, which is going to show you what you need for your evidence. And that's what we're doing. We're capturing the evidence. So the good, that's an ins what we call an Inspire 1. I don't have that here tonight. That's the nice big, that's the Ferrari of drones, or as we call them, and we'll call them drones. Everybody knows them as drones. That's the Ferrari. That's the good. That's the bad. And that does happen. Um, in uh, the, the, mid, uh, the Middle East, um, our friends are using drones for uh, IEDs. Um, the uh, Americans are training birds of prey to attack the drones and take them out of the sky. Uh, our guys have been down in the central west tablelands and had our drones attacked by birds of prey. So that is the bad. The ugly? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, we got, forgot about that. <laughs> oh, jeez. <laughs> the ugly. Oh, that's the ugly. No, that's the real ugly. Or well, it should have been the other way. One of the others. Anyway, that's when they crash. Um, and I will put our hand up. We've had a couple of misses. We've currently just crashed an Inspire 1. Um, and it's beyond repair, and that's four and a half thousand dollars down the drain. So, but we have got another one. One overtime so. shift. Pardon? One overtime shift. <laughs> oh, it is. Yeah. Um, so anyway, that's the ugly, and that can happen. Um, and when they do come down, they come down hard. We haven't got one, but you can actually put a parachute on a drone, um, and as it's coming down, it, if it loses power, it works on. Um, I think the altimeter and just the right um, deploys and it'll bring your, your drone down safely. So, 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 so do you still um, save footage? Is it safe? Safe, yeah, yeah. It's actually recorded to a, uh, a little S micro SD, <coughs> and so, or you can live stream it down to your tablet, um, which is your, usually your screen. So, there's a couple of options you can do, but I'll record them to the SD and then download that because um, you sort of that's enough. Um, regulations. Has this got a point in me? Yep, there we go. All right, so the RPAS, I always call it an RPAS, that's what I refer to as a little, sometimes a drone, but the RPAS is Civil Aviation Safety Authority. That's who uh, we are policed by. Um, it's governed by Part 101 of the rules. Um, these rules were pretty stringent, and they've relaxed them, and they're relaxing a bit more. Um, commercial operators. Now, when we've got this idea, one of our guys goes, let's go and get a drone, right? Happy days, let's go and buy one. But what uh, happened was the fire brigade said, we're going we're gonna to put ourselves together, we're going to come under one umbrella. CASA said, you are a commercial operator. We said, we don't make any money out of it. 
they don't care. Mm. Every emergency services will be a commercial operator. So you will have to have a remote operator certificate, or used to be called a UAC, but that's what it is now. That gives the organisation and or, if you're a private enterprise, your business, to actually authority then to fly, okay? If you're a hobbyist, um, you can go and fly where you like, but you must also comply with the rules. Um, pilots, what word I don't like using, uh, must hold a um, UAB, a licence. So how long does it take to get a certificate and cost? Okay, um, we, it, it can vary, but in our first instance, we had to have five hours of flying, which sounds yeah. crazy, doesn't it? Go and fly for five hours before you get to do the course, but that's what we had to do. So we've got five hours on the sticks, get yeah. the hang of using it. We did a week course, which cost three and a half thousand dollars per person. We then get it tested, and um, and then from there we get our certificate and away we go and fly. We also have to do a radio operators course. Now that sounds pretty crazy, but I had to go into Bankstown Airport, get on a telephone, and talk to a computer to see. If, and it was asking me area um, aviation questions, which I don't know nothing about. They wanted to know if I could speak English. And I know it sounds wrong, but that's just what it is. From that, we are then able to monitor um, the um, aviation channels, and we do a watch and, um, and listen. So if I'm out in the, in the country, which I have done, at some of the country locations, um, aircraft, once they sort of get out of the, the Sydney area, can sort of fly where they need to, and I'll listen. And then I'll put a report out over the aviation channels, because I've been allowed to do that, I, I can just, and I just put a, a call up saying that I'm here, and that they know that I'm here. Um, and I'll get into the, the bit more nitty degree later, so I won't jump too far into that. Wait, yep. do those regulations apply if you're flying a drone that's under a kilo, or whatever the weight restriction is for the... I'll come to that as well, yeah. alright, yeah. Guys are um, on top of it. Um, as a basic rule, okay, let's keep this in a basic <laughs> sense, to get too, too technical. Um, cannot fly within 30 metres of objects, buildings, or people, regardless <laughs> of the height. What that means is that I'm governed at 400 feet. I can't go any higher than 400 feet, which is 120 metres, okay? At 400 feet, I've still got to be 30 metres away from the person here, okay? Or that object over here. Okay, that's the way, the tunnel goes up, but it's still that way. Because if it falls from that height, the wind could blow up there, or there. But if it falls from this height, it could still go. That's the rules. We are looking for exemptions, and there are exemptions that can be a bit closer. The way we get around it on the fire ground, if I take control of the fire ground. So every on my fire ground knows that I'm operating, and I let them all know. There's going to be a drone, you put your helmets on, or you get out. Be aware, if I call call out, drone coming down, and you put over radio, or coming out, run, or whatever, yeah, move, it's gonna come down. But I've got control of those people. If you're down the local football field, and you're watching your kids or your video on them, you've got no control over these people. They don't know what's going on, and these are some of the rules. So these are the rules that are putting in place. And as I move on, we're gonna, we are going to look for exemptions to cover fire and rescue, uh, because we need to do certain things in an emergency situation. We haven't got time to sort of play nicely, and again, I'll, I'll move on and show you some of that stuff. The aircraft must be within control of sight, um, as a basic rule. Um, I have spoken about having um, navigational aids, and it can be further along. Um, I know the police wanted to do a big distance once down in Wagga, they wanted to, to track a murder trail at the four and a half k's. So they they flew to this spot, then walked out, drove down there, took over, and then moved, kept moving along, um, which, is, which is good. Uh, the Victorians have done the same thing. They uh, they had they worked. For, the Victorians worked for the entire state, and they had a plane crash and had to do some filming for the coroner. So they actually showed the flight of the aircraft that come in to crash into the uh, into the ground. And uh, not that it's great, but it was uh, it's a good piece of gear for the uh, for the coroner. The controller must have the ability to control the aircraft for the conditions of flight, wind, obstacles, power lines, you name it. Birds of prey coming in at you, you know, from the from the distance. You've got to be able to control that because it is something that's quite heavy, and if it hits someone in the head, it can do some damage. This stage, you can't fly at night. Yeah, they've got some beautiful LED lights on them, and they look great, but you can't fly at night. Um, and the, the funny thing is, with these things, you think your red lights are at the rear, you see the back. No, the red lights are at the front. So when you start first flying this thing, I'm thinking I'm flying it back to front, but no, it's not, because the green lights are at the rear, and they don't work on port and starboard, which is another thing you'd think of, that they work port and starboard, because um, the aircraft have got port and starboard lights, but these things don't. So I don't know where that came from, whether it's a manufacturer thing internationally, but it's something that's got to get used to. Do you know to. if that's different in the US, if they can fly at night? Uh, I don't know. Okay. I, don't, I don't know. You Here, think, you, know, you can't. Do you, you think that'll change? Uh, I don't think so, no. You can fly here at night. 
all the new operator certificates coming out with night exemptions. Are they? Oh, yeah. oh there you go. And within 15 metres as well. Yeah, well, as I say, the exemptions are changing. When we first started, when I first started, um, and I'll show you a, 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 a map in a moment, there was virtually nowhere in Sydney you could fly. Because you couldn't fly within 5.5 kilometres or 300 yeah. miles of a helicopter landing pad. And they're everywhere. You wouldn't be surprised. They are, it was, it sort of, I was talking to our boss and I said, oh, I want to show the bosses this, this machine and how we use it. The only place we could go and fly was Rookwood Cemetery. And he said, I don't think it's a good place. And I said, neither do I. But we're asking unless we go all the way out to Heathcote. But it was really, really, really tough. So there you go. It's changing. The other thing is, too, you've got to be really careful of the statement aircraft cannot go below 500 feet. They, they can and they do regularly. Let me, let me give you the yeah. general, as I said, this is a general rule yeah. of what we've been taught, taught. They're going to go below 500 feet when they land, but when we're operating at 400, as a, uh, level, a ceiling of 400 feet, they're not supposed to go below 500 feet, is my understanding. And, that, and that's what we, we teach our guys, and that's what yeah. we work on, okay? And that's what we do. So we also contact the local towers if there's a tower. Um, even if I'm at um, the Central Coast or up at uh, the Hunter, if there's an airfield nearby, I ring that airfield and I let them know that we're operating. And they go, yeah, cool, we know where you are. And can you stay at that? Yep. Yeah. And I hear the aircraft coming. So, as I say, as a general rule, this is what we're talking about. Um, cannot fly within um, three nautical miles or 5.5 kilometres of, of the centre of a runway and it sort of radiates out from the, um, the airfield. Uh, cannot fly within restricted airspace unless permission is granted, and usually after 72 hours, and again, I'll come to a map in a moment and show that. Uh, restricted airspace includes military airspace, which is Richmond, Nowra, Williamtown, uh, Moorbank, Holsworthy, uh, flight lanes, uh, 5 a, uh, Romeo 503 Alpha is an example, and Victor 1. What that means is Victor 1 is off the coast, it's a transit lane uh, for aircraft to come through Sydney because they can't really come in <coughs> through the middle of Sydney. You imagine some of these little Cessna is coming through over the Harbour Bridge, and you know, 787 is coming in through on, on their flight path. It gets a bit ugly. Um, Ramio 503 Alpha um, is a helicopter uh, sort of lane which runs up Parramatta River. And there's a big arc out to the north of that where you can't fly in there. Forbes, he asked me today if we go and fly a house fire at Lane Cove, and I couldn't because it's in that restricted airspace. Um, again, we are looking for exemptions to fly in those areas um, so that we don't have to ask permission, we will get those exemptions. Um, for us, for organisations, your controllers must be licensed. As I said, hobbyists do not need a licence. Um, residential privacy must be considered. And this is a big thing a lot of people ask me when they, they talk about people that are hobbyist. Oh, you go and fly in the backyard and someone's looking over their backyard. They're not supposed to do that. You can ring Castor and make a complaint and if Castor can find them, they can, they can actually give that person a fine. A friend of mine was in um, Miami. She was on the 18th floor of a building and she thought she was nice and safe. So she's there and she's toweling herself off like this. True story, this is not an exaggeration. The next thing a drone comes up and it's blinking at her, she's looking through the windows and she went over and looked and thought, what the hell is that? And it was a drone. Someone was flying up and looked through the windows. So there goes the privacy up. Which that's, that is a, it's a true story. So in the States, who knows what they do? Um, and then we've seen Paul and Hanson recently on the media, you know, so that's all gone another, another path. How many other friends have you got to tell, Megan? <laughs> Plenty. Um, now, a flight activity, we, we fill out a, um, a FAR, I'll pass these around and have a look. This is what we fill out before we, um, before we actually fly. Um, technically, these are supposed to be done in advance. Um, maybe the private guys have to do something similar, but for us, we are in an emergency situation. I've got a house, I've got the police there, or a structure, whatever. I need to fly, I need to fly now. So I need to do this, my risk assessments there and then. I ring my chief controller. While I'm going to fly here, he checks the address, happy days, and away I go. As long as I've done my checks, and I can fly within that, because sometimes I might be right next to a oh, set of high tension wires, and they give off um, electromagnetic fields and interferes with the drone. So you control the lane while you see the fire rescue? Yes, yeah. Yeah. Okay. He's, a, he's our aviation officer, okay. so he's the chief controller, and when he's on holidays, I'm the deputy controller. Now you spring up and say, what we're going to do. <laughs> All right, um, one of the best apps to come out from CASA is Can I Fly There? It's really simple to use. You type in the address and it says yes or no. When I was talking before about restricted airspace, that is restricted airspace. Okay? There. That's um, Richmond. 
So that is a massive area. That's this their, their airport area. So that's uh, three nautical miles from here up here. You can see that's their, their takeoff and the landing approaches from there. But that there goes all the way down now is all residential area. And I've probably flown about half a dozen jobs down there where each time I'm in Richmond Tower. On one occasion, I've had one um, tower operator who has really given me a grilling. And he said, you guys shouldn't be doing this. And I said, well, this is the process we've got. We go through the, the processes we have. He said, you need to make um, set something up with their chief um, air controller so that we sort of almost have a local exemption with them and they're happy with that. He said, um, but the other controllers have all been cool. One said, don't go above 120 feet. I said, no worries, I don't need to, even though we can go to 400. But that's, that's uh, uh, as I say, restricted airspace. Here you can see all these landing ports. That's helicopter landing pads. That's Bankstown. And there's awesome. Kingsman Smith in there. All right. Um, that's controlled airspace. We can't go in there. We are looking at getting the exemption to go within controlled airspace. That will be that um, you know we can we can fly there, con it's contact the tower, and they really can't put enough exemption. I had a fatality at Bangor. We needed to fly. The guy at Bankstown was not going to let us fly. He said, "No, you're not." And I said, "We we had to be had to fly. We needed this information. We couldn't get an aerial appliance in there. We really needed it. It was very important." So we ended up going through CASA in Canberra and got an exemption for that one day for that one job. And again, it was building that rapport and knowing that we don't go skylighting, which we don't do. That's what it comes up. No fly zone. Um, and that's Richmond. Uh, Romeo 470, it's restricted. Just can't go in there. And you can be right there. And that's restricted airspace. And that, that little, um, this app will tell us, uh, I've never been right on the border. If I was, I'd go to the other side of the road. And if the wind accidentally pushed me in there, well, well that's what happened. But I was in outside. This is a, a, a large one. You can see this is all restricted to the north. Um, and down here at Nowra. Um, Forbes, he had a job in Nowra the other month. And uh, our, I was on holidays. The chief controller rang up and Nowra just said, you are not flying through there. Okay? You are not going to fly there. I spoke to a mate of mine who's a pilot. He went down there one day on a joint flight and he found himself in a bit of trouble and they very quickly got him out of there. They're very, very um, heavily active down that way. So for you guys from the RFS, um, you'll know that that's a, is a bit of a problem, you know, with your own choppers and so forth. Um, but yeah, um, Holesworthy, yeah, I haven't been anywhere too bad in there. I've been right on the edge, but it was all pretty good. But there, there's definitely areas we, um, we have to uh, consider. Um, Kingsford Smith, Bankstown. That's actually Westmead, um, and that's a navigational, controlled by navigational aids, but mm -hmm. when I've actually done a plot in there, it still says I can fly in there, um, but that's the end of, um, of Holesworthy there. Uh, and that's the uh, controlled airspace. I don't, I'm not sure where I picked that up from. I did this about a month ago, but um, it obviously said that um, not to exceed 120 metres, which is 400. Wayne, can you just go back one slide? Yep. Now, where you Holsworthy, what's the, is there a helicopter pad or Holsworthy to the left coming that's, down? That the, down, down. The, the Camel Town. What's the, that one? That's probably the hospital. Oh, it's probably okay. Camel Town Hospital. Every hospital now has got a, a pad, but it's yeah. not controlled. So you can fly within three nautical miles of that. But you keep on watching and listening out, you know. Okay. Um, there is a book called an URSA. We've got a copy of the URSA we carry, and URSA uh, identifies all of the um, air spaces. And it gives you the, the CTAP channel, which is the area. So we, we haven't got it here with me. While well, I dial it up, we can just have a listen. Um, and I flew down to Metagon, same thing. It said there's an uncontrolled local field. So I actually dialed it up, and I could hear the planes coming in, and I just put a call out, let them know that I was flying at, you know, um, whatever this height it was, 80 metres or whatever it was. Just so they know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I was nowhere near, and I wasn't in their space. And I rang the field and said, hey, guys, this is where I am between here and here. And again, it just builds that rapport. All right, um, that's what it was like before we got these exemptions and we're looking at all this. So there was no way you could fly anywhere, you just as I say. And that's just part of it. Um, it was just everything overlapped, you know, from, um, from uh, helicopter landing pads. Now this, when I first got into this gig, this is a VTC, I think that's right, VTC. Trying to read this is crazy. Like, and I'm still learning. So this yellow, this purple dot's Victor 1, that's the lane going up and down Sydney. In around there is Romeo 405 Alpha. I was wrong before about 403, my apologies. Um, that's that area there, it's like a, that's the Parramatta River. And you'll see the helicopters flying up and down there all the, all the time. Um, and then to the north, that's all restricted. Um, so we're looking at 
um, flying in there, and I, I have flown in there by mistake, um, because I could see this part, and I thought this is all good, but I couldn't see this line up here on the map that I was looking at. It wasn't too bad, I didn't cause any dramas. Um, all these are to do with uh, flight levels. Um, if you imagine what it's like, the best way it's been described to me is Sydney air control is like an upside down wedding cake. At Sydney airport it's like this, and it just gets bigger. So then your, your clearance goes, and their control goes further out, but it just sort of comes down like that. So. You've just got to be careful. Um, there are flight lanes, um, more flight lanes there, and you do see the planes going above, um, and you, hopefully you don't, don't hit them, and it just gets bigger and bigger. All right, what have we flown? This is a bit of a background for the whole fire and rescue. Uh, floods in the central west and far north coast. Uh, infrastructure inspections, yes, damn, they couldn't get to an area, and they thought it was going to collapse, and they found they had concrete cancer. So um, luckily our boys went in and flew that. Um, some active structural fires, um, again, this stage mainly in the GSA because uh, the response time would be far too great to get out Greater there. Sydney area. Yep, the GSA. <coughs> um, which I've got some footage later to show you a fire at Shalora using an infrared camera and it's really, really good. Bushfire investigations, which I've done with a couple of the guys from here. Uh, we've, we've done a few uh, bushfire um, investigations where the, the RFS guys have come in and helped us. And we've been able to fly in and it's, quite, it's really good. Uh, chopper's four grand an hour, um, and this is nowhere near as much. Rapid damage assessments, live feed. We can actually live feed back to a, our MCC, which is our control vehicle, or we can live feed into uh, to wherever, uh, as long as we can get that connection. So they had live feed, they were having a live setup of the damage coming into the SES at Wollongong. Us, um, for fire investigations, and then um, training exercise and research development. And uh, we've done some research with one of the companies about deploying materials and we did all sorts of mucking around and um, any time we want to see the fire behaviour and some research, we've done a bit of footage. And from the AAFI last year, yeah. I flew behind and, um, and so we recorded that. What are we doing? Future to Alex, your point. Um, where's sub-7 kilo? That's the licence we're at. So. Um, that's the, 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 the actual aircraft is we can fly. We're actually looking at going up to um, sub 25 kilo. That's the uh, Matrice, which so can deliver a payload. Um, so we're looking at storm, um, a swift water rescue and hazmat situations. Where we can't go in, we'll go and drop something in or take monitors in and do air readings or whatever the case may be. And that's the path of where it's going. Um, someone asked me today, you know, like, where do you think this is gonna go? And I just said, I don't know. Because asked me this three years ago, and you know, I, I sort of thought we're just going to be hovering up there and not do anything further. But now we're going out for, further ahead. Our aim is that um, the RPAS will be responded to all fourth alarm incidents. <coughs> now, for that is, as soon as it starts getting a fourth alarm, um, we will go and become that aerial platform. So, <coughs> given the number of fourth alarms we're having, going, that's a fair bit of a workload for you guys. Tomorrow, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, the, someone's got to pay the overtime. Yeah, it's <laughs> not my problem. Yeah, fair enough. But the um, fourth alarm, they're turning out um, a lot of other equipment. Yeah. And the, the view is, and uh, Mr. Kingsley will tell me if I'm wrong or right, the view is nowadays is to get a big response there, get the gear there. If we don't need yeah. to send it back. Yeah. But don't wait, and then it's a slow, we, we just get everything we can. You know, the TAF 20, which is that little machine that, yeah, you know, uh, throws the phone around. Get them there. Get it may not be our unit that oh, yeah. just our operational command. Right. Yeah, it'll be the, the entire RPAS section, yeah. which at this stage there's six of us. We're training another 10. Oh, so there's going to be 16, and it will exponentially get bigger. But we're still in that, that learning stage. Um, hazard reductions for pre and post burns. Map the area to see what's going on, and then look after, uh, sorry, see what's going on afterwards. So um, four bushfire officers are being trained at the moment. They'll be given their gear and that, that's part of what they'll be doing. Um, the rest of the investigators will be trained as, as pilots, so Fawlty, um, Byrne and Cole will be trained up. That not, might be a good strategy. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? Well, <laughs> the cost of the damage for him would be national. It's not my budget. Steve's <laughs> looking to have to do that. Please do it. And we're looking at, let's talk about going regional, um, because a lot of times, as you all know, regional gets forgotten, and, um, and it shouldn't be. Well, we know we've already got the change in licence for the nighttime exemptions. Um, for us, it's to control, uh, fly within controlled and restricted airspaces. Um, but your images that you get at night would be justifiable for the 
Or, or would not it? Not from, from the FIU perspective, probably not. Yeah. But for the fire side of it, uh, for combating fire, looking at, um, well, you can't have, um, well, you can have a chop off light night, yeah. yeah. But normally, correct me if I'm wrong, they're grounded, yeah. They don't, they don't usually fly at night and do any yeah, water well, operations. We do a lot more the night stuff. Yeah, so if they're down, we'll then go, we could, our pets might be able to go up yeah. and do that monitoring of the night time and see what's going on. Okay, okay um, we go and we're structurally unsafe. Um, gather the data before it's lost <coughs> and you know what happens because uh, where's our insurance company people? Oh, they love it. They just come in and bulldoze everything, don't they? Let's just bulldoze. Let's make safe. So if we can capture that. Those burn patterns, whatever, we've got them. Um, work out if it's safe to enter. Work with the engineers, I've done a couple of those where they've looked at it and said, okay, let's show us this or show us that um, to make sure that we're not putting ourselves in an unsafe position. How, do you, how does your phantom go in, in the confined spaces? Um, yeah, I'll, I'll come to that. <laughs> yeah. Um, aerial observations, um, and instead of putting it, let's call it the cherry picker, really, you know, we can't get to some places. This thing can go anywhere we want to go, as long as I can fly there. Um, as I say, bushfire is cost effective. Um, we can follow the path of fire travel, which we did up at Bataba. Um, Four of you said to me, fly through the trees, and I'm going like this. You know, I'm worried about bringing this bloody down. Oh, you'll be right, you'll be right. Yeah, it's, all, it's easy, it's easy, he says. Yeah, you try, you try it, Forbesy. Yeah, um, as the wind's pushing things around, and yeah. Um, limitations weather, wind, and rain. Um, I, Monday I had to fly a local emergency management exercise at Mossvale, it was going great. Had it up there, cops loved it, everybody loved it until it started raining and then I had to pull it down again. And uh, they were using the drone actually for security because the exercise was a foot and mouth outbreak and they were worried about people coming in so I was trying to use that as their eye in the sky to control people coming in and out but unfortunately not real good. Why don't you stick a umbrella on top of it? <laughs> Probably fly away like Mary Poppins. <laughs> um, Richard before asked about um, flying inside. Um, some of the inference that I've encountered is, um, and what they say is uh, communication towers, those mobile phone towers, massive um, electro electromagnetic interference, and they, they just go haywire. Um, large metal structures, power sources, anything that gets put in that out, but the metal structures, because it actually, it interferes with it, because remember, you've got your controller, and that's sending a radio wave to this, and it's going to be on. I flew um, inside our new headquarters, they, when it was under construction, they said, you can come and fly inside, so we want to see it, and sort of fly it through, and I'm flying down, I'm thinking, how good is this, this is great, and all of a sudden, without a word of a lie, this is the truth, the thing went, bang, up towards the window, and come back again. So obviously, you have to imagine, my internal started doing those ones, and I'm going, no, no, no. And what it was was, um, we've got a massive big communications sort of tower at, at Greenacre, and there must have been an interference coming across, and that picked it up. So after that, I shouldn't tell you this, but then we flew inside doing these ones. Check that we were flying up and down, it was really good. No, I'm sorry, but, but it still looks good on film. Did you use your GPS program? Do you program GPS? I don't, I don't do dot uh, waypoints. Yeah. You can, but normally I'm flying by sight. I want to see what I want to do. Yeah. Uh, but for bushfire stuff, you know, that, that would, I dare say, come in handy. And one of our guys is, who's a uh, pilot, is in mapping. They're working towards all that. So they could set it up. And one of the things with rapid damage assessment for the USAR is that they will they'll fly patterns like this. Mm -hmm. And they, they will build all that up and they'll build a picture, but that's outside my level of understanding because I, um, I just don't know. Do you have a power over the other commercial users that come in, like Channel 1 and that, that are trying to get the fire scene, what you were trying to investigate? I've had um, space. I have a real good rapport with the media. Um, I do. The camera loves me. They do. I'm I had a boss laughing because I had an incident the other day. Um, <laughs> Like they come up and they say, can we have the footage? And I say, no, because it's a crime scene, it belongs to the police and technically the coroner. I always use that, it covers everything. Um, I say, no. Uh, they say, what if we fly? I say, well, technically, this is my fire ground. I own this whole fire ground from here to the infinity. You cannot come under my fire ground. So no. You want to put it up once I'm gone, happy days. But the media are moving into that sphere and, and then the day will come. Um, <coughs> Can we stop them when they get a chopper and take footage? But they're not going to throw the money at it. But there's stuff that, if the police say it's sensitive, and remember, we're all working well from our side of it, and dare say the RFS as well, you're working with the police on a, on a criminal matter at that stage. You know, you don't know where it's going to go. And um, unfortunately, like the, the terrorist situation where they've jumped in and built the brief around them, 
you know, you're going to build the brief first and then go and get the cook. So you don't want the cook to know what you know so that you can you can capture them. So to so your point, we're trying to keep keep a control of it. But hey, you get sticky bees will come up. You know, just the hobbyist and we'll say, oh, I want to, you know, I'm flying around. Hey, listen, sorry, you got to, you've got to put it down while we're in there. There's a lot more of scenes, you know, the news company seem to send it up and hover above us when they're at a job. Yeah. Um, that they might be doing that otherwise. They shouldn't be because they're in breach of, of even though it's down down to 15 metres, they'd still be in breach. They'd be, you know, 15 metres really is the width of the, the property, your average you know, residential property. Um, and they're, if they move it, they're in breach. But um, you sort of, we can't sort of stop them. We don't. We say we own it, but at this stage I think it's a bit of bluff. And I'm bigger than them anyway, so they don't argue with And crankier. Um, <coughs> Oops, sorry. Um, flight limitations, due to airspace rules, I've already gathered that. Lost control of flyway, it does happen. And I've heard it a number of times that people said I was flying over water watching the kids water scooting, and then the thing just fell out the water. Uh, why? I don't know. They just, it just flies away. Or a fellow was saying the other day he had one, and it just flew off into the stratosphere. It did, it just kept going. So where it comes down, who knows? We have been told of a story uh, that um, they actually saw one up at in about 18,000 feet. I don't know how true it was, but someone said they saw one up there and it just, it obviously just flew away. Um, mechanical or battery failure, this has happened to me. Um, I was flying a job and uh, I was doing some footage. I was only two stories high and all of a sudden it came up on the screen, um, massive voltage, uh, battery voltage failure and the thing started coming down. But I was enough, I had enough height to be able to bring it away from the, from the bushes and get it on the ground. And I'm thinking, what's going on? So I put another battery in, it worked, but things can go wrong and they do go wrong. Um, we're talking earlier about, Rick, about the batteries. With the, batteries. Battery, yeah. the big thing with these, in the early days, and um, I have done a couple of uh, investigations at uh, shops where, or one has a shop, another business where, private business, sorry, private house, where the light power batteries have caught fire. Um, because they're so unstable and you can't take them on aircraft. There's limitations with that and they've got to, they really should be in, in, um, in fire resistant bags. Uh, the police who have got drains were on their way back from Newcastle and the back of their car caught fire because a battery failed um, and overheated. Um, I was told the other day the cops are now um, putting their batteries into a fridge when they finish flying. I don't know how they do that, but anyway, um, to cool them down, to bring them down. But on the other hand, if it's too cold, you've got to warm the battery up because it won't operate correctly if it's, if it's not warm enough. So it's a, it's, they're very powerful, they're very light, but they're also very volatile. Um, and the shot fire I did at Campbelltown, the hobbyist was out running around that morning flying his drone. He came back and um, put it on charge, went upstairs to the toilet, and within a couple of minutes, the entire back of the shop was alight, um, and it, we brought it back down to that, that battery. If you go onto YouTube, you'll see a lot of them are failing. Is that right, Richard? Yes, that sort of stuff? Yeah, they're very volatile. Yeah. How does that go if you're doing you know, an assessment? Because that battery that you've got in the Mavic is like 5 degrees to 40 degrees. That's its range. How do you yeah. get if the temperature is greater than 40 degrees when you're flying through there? Uh, well, uh, you know, in a structure? Yeah. Uh, when I'm going and flying inside, it's not hot. It's not? No, no. No, no. Not, no, not at, uh, by the time we get there, it's out and it's, it's not that hot, no. Um, How high would you be flying over the structure though? Like maybe. I was just thinking, you know, if you're flying over something and it gets really hot, like you know, like you're flying over a fire, obviously if you're close. I'll, I'll, can I, I've got some footage which might answer that question, okay. um, which we've got. It's a, I'm gonna, I've taken excerpts out of a lot of flights to try and, you can see, so to give you some answers and um, I can talk my way through that. This is for us, um, probably without blowing our own trumpet, we're the, only, we're the leaders really in the country, to my knowledge, of flying inside and a lot of fire investigations. Melbourne have been in front of us, but they're not doing a lot of fire investigation. Their investigators use their, their pilots, which is another section, to come and fly their jobs. We're doing it ourselves and learning our way. So flying inside, um, the loss of GPS, and I'm probably jumping a little bit out of skill, is that when you put the unit up, you, um, you calibrate it and it gives you a GPS location. So you put it up and fly it and it sits there. Then you put it, control it, it won't move. The wind will want to push it, but it'll stay there. When you come inside, you lose GPS. So it's what you call attitude flying. You're flying by skill. And you're affected by crosswinds, uh, any drafts, because this thing puts down a downdraft, so that draft comes back up and it'll push you around. 
because I had an accident in the office one day with an umbrella. Um, it's, it does, so you've got to be careful that you lose that control. So when you're inside, um, you've got, as we all know, we've been there, we've got wires hanging down, we've got ceilings hanging down, we've got all sorts of stuff hanging down. We lose, you've got to, oh, sorry, you've got to be careful of that, uh, of stuff hanging down. Loss of GPS, as I say, wind effective control. Visual loss of aircraft, and the next photo will show that. Um, judging of depth of field, and you know, I had Forbes here the other day as my trainee, I love saying that, and he will start buying coffee. Um, and we said, it makes an old, uh, sorry, an old, he's a, he is a trained pilot. Um, it's a depth of field, so you think, I'm close enough? Because you're outside of structure, and you're in, and you're, you're looking at that, and you're looking at the screen, and you're looking at everything else, and you want to fly into something. You fly into something and lose it, and you've got four grand sitting in the ground, and you can't go and re recover it. Well, you're not supposed to. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, that's a difficult part. They do have sensors, but then the sensor may stop you from getting in as close as you need to get. Uh, and sufficient power to get out. And what I mean by that, because at 30% of the battery, the warning light come, we set ours to 30%. 30% it let you know that it's time to bring it home. At 15%, it brings itself home. But it brings itself home by going up to a height that you set and then come across. It doesn't reroute itself through the maze that you've just flown through. Mm. So you might be going through a rabbit warren, thinking, I'm pretty good at this, but then you've got to realise you've got to get back out. And you're doing it all by, by sight, by what's on the screen. So you've got to be really careful there. All right, that's our Phantom 4. Um, that's pretty easy to see. Um, that's just the house. That was um, This was taken for demonstration purposes. There it is. Lovely, it's nice and white. Can you tell me where the aircraft is now? <coughs> just up there. Uh, yeah. It's grey. Mm -hmm. This is it here. Oh yeah, it's got, got some nice flashing lights, but Sometimes you don't see them, and that's, mm. that is a problem which I've encountered. When you're, you're standing outside and your light's different. Because um, remember, we're outside of structure, it's dark in there, um, and I'm looking at sort of putting some nice fluoro stuff on these things so we can see a bit better. And there it is there. So you can see how you lose it in the background of all the burnt material. Um, oh, that's just the log um, that you have on your, on your iPad, so you can always go back and look at what's going, what's going on. I you know, don't think this is going to work, so we've got a backup plan, as you always do. So bear with me a moment, please. Um, I had one of the guys at work who's a techno genius put all these up. And that's, these are all videos, but they, um, they're not working, so... This is the very first um, job that I flew, which is inside. It forms you rang me up and said, we've got a very serious job. It is structurally unsafe to fly inside. Oh shit. I was scared. And I was. And when you're flying inside, you're trying to fly the machine, it's getting pushed around by the wind, you're trying not to fly into something, and you're trying to video record at the same time. The cameras on these aircraft, they go up and down. Okay? If you want to look left and right, you've got to move the aircraft. So you've got to make sure that you're not flying into something. I flew this with a Phantom 4. So that's that white one you saw, which I don't have here tonight. And it has some prop guards around it, but um, they're not fail safe, those prop guards. Because on one job, it pushed me into the corner of brickwork and chopped up the rotors and the thing fell down. Luckily, I was 300 mil off the ground um, because there was crosswinds. So again, you can just see what we can capture um, before we lose that job. That job um, was a really serious incident, which the police wanted to try and get as much evidence they could. I flew that. Uh, that, that um, structure from various angles and different sides, trying to get what they're looking for. Um, but that's what we can get because that was unsafe, and to my uh, knowledge, they uh, demolished that that building. Is that right, mate? Fawzi? Yeah. Yeah, they had to demolish it. So we're losing what we what we um, what we want. Uh, Parramatta Cafe. And you can see here from above the, the beauty of looking at our overhead damage, which is what we're looking for. We couldn't have got that, that clarity from an aerial. There is an aerial there, but we couldn't have got the clarity, which from the drone, um, you can. You're not governed by um, what's below. This is inside that, that particular structure. Um, again, think it's pretty easy to fly through those doors? No. The wind's pushing it, and then there I go. I thought I was going to hit the doorway. And the boss would have to buy me a new one, but no, I did it. Would the micro drones be easier, do you think? 
I've, I've used the, the Mavic once, mm -hmm. and I'm really impressed. It seems a lot more stable platform. It's not getting pushed around as much. Um, I don't know why. Richard, you had any idea? I don't know. No. no. <coughs> Maybe, yeah. Yeah. Probably yeah. just downforce, yeah. Yeah, possibly. Um, why so, better, do you think? Or? For this yeah. application, for sure. The, the Mavic's pretty most suitable. If you just don't get that, that turbulence. You do get a, you do get you do get that turbulence, and we put prop guards on, which we put on, so that if I bump into a wall, I'll bounce off, and that's the beauty. Um, and I'll, I'll rig this up in a sec. Um, that's the good, that's the bad, and on the ugly side of this job. Again, that's Forbesy there. Okay. Um, okay. Sorry about this getting a little fraction off my head. Um, Okay, this is just quickly, again, another, another house fire, and I'm trying to get little excerpts. See that there, the overhead damage there? We wouldn't have got that if we didn't have the drone. So, in this case, we're able to fly in and, and capture stuff. Um, the overhead showed it really well. You know. At that stage, we had the reports this was a roof fire. Um, from some of this stuff and some further investigation, we actually tracked it back down to a cigarette butt below the veranda. Mm -hmm. um, which gives our V pattern up because we're looking at drop down and all sorts of stuff. And the next bit of footage was the reason why I, I'll just show you why how close you can get in what we're looking for. Um, because at that stage we're still operating when I'm flying this on a um, on a roof fire. So I just sort of thought I'll try and get um, looking at my damage there and looking at this here. I'm thinking, well, what have I got coming here? And I couldn't get to it. So. Again, trying to fly the machine, trying to um, just work out my light and just trying to capture what I can. Like I say, I take video footage and then take my stills from that. I can always enlarge my stills, but I can't enlarge my, 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 my video, but I can, I can work with it. So I was here looking at my top plate. I was looking to see what I could pick up here is, am I looking for my heat source? What have I got there? Um, just seeing what we could capture. Hey, it doesn't take much to fly it. Fly a lot, capture a lot, and then just use what you can. So um, it gets a little bit better in a second. And that's the real reason for not using pilots who want to FI train. Mm. Look, you learn by experience. Mm. And I've, um, I've, I think I've got about 28 hours or 27 hours of flying now, which sounds doesn't sound much. But when you do a five minute flight, when you're doing five minutes, five minutes, it does add up. So here I get the, this is the better, the, the money shot, so to speak, because I'm getting my top plate completely, I'm looking at this area here, I'm looking at all this, I'm saying, this is an area of interest, correlates with this. Yeah. Okay, so now I'm starting to get that information, which I wouldn't have otherwise got from the ground. And um, look, um, as I say, that's just the, the beauty of, uh, uh, this is uh, the first sort of bushfire, wildfire we did. With, um, with Mark, and um, what we did, we just put the um, flags out, and we know for the uh, for those who are non-RFS, you use your flags as indicators for back burning and lateral burns and um, running fires. Excuse I'm getting good at this, aren't I? Real good. I'm yes, lateral fires. Oh, great. Yeah, yeah. Can I get a pass? Yeah, I'll sign you off. Have a nice you. Yeah. Bible yeah. 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 printed. Yeah. <laughs> um, so it's good for that overhead. It's, it's, it, is, it is really good for that. It shows the pattern. Um, unfortunately, I do have a really good one, but the matter's before the court, so I can't use it, unfortunately. Uh, that's, that's not real good. So there's a question on court. How does the court receive this stuff? Um, it's like anything. They'll take it as, as long as it's going to be um, admissible. Yep. So you have the defence care. We haven't got that far yet. Um, so... It's like anything. It's like any 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 um, photos. Yeah. It's you know it's your A memoir, it's your evidence. So here's Badaba, um, <laughs> which we did. We, 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 yeah. 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 So we we went just gives you an overall, just shows you the damage and the run of the fire, where it went, and what it, what, you know um, the right. scope. This is at 400 feet, so you can just see the advantage of saying, okay, paint the picture. Mm. We can't get the chopper, but we can use this. Um, I've had a discussion with Bob, and I know the RFS guys are really keen to get this up and going, and I think it'd be a great tool for, for you guys for your investigations. Um, we are available for hire. We'll come out and do it at a really good rate. It's, it's, only, it's only a couple of coffees. Coffees? Coffees? Coffees. Okay, here is another one. Again, just quickly showing the flags. Um, 
So the flag just set out, and this is the one where Forty said, fly this way and through the trees, and I'm going, yeah, Mick. And you can see the wind's pushing the flags around. So I'm thinking, I'm going to get blown around, I'm going to fly this into a bloody tree. But luckily we didn't. And again, it's quite slow. Um, because you, you just want to take your time, you know? And what's the quality of the um, of Bob Chuja of like foreign objects and destroy? Um, I tried to get those foreign objects out there. <laughs> <laughs> it's, really, it's like you know one of those you know those untrained dogs. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So what's the quality of the image you're getting from the stills? You, you mentioned good. The stills. Good. Yeah, yeah, good. Yeah, yeah, good. No, they are. They're quite clear. Um, <laughs> so you are recording in 1080p or 4K? 4K. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Does that sound right? <laughs> oh, well, the good thing is 4K is, is you can zoom it in four times and it's still as good as 1080p, right? Alright, so this is our Shalora Waste, waste oh, okay. Fire. Okay. I, um, I picked the wrong one. Wrong one on last. So I might stop that because I want to come back to that without jumping ahead. Um, this is the one. So, Acme Fire, as you can tell, um, the drone's got called for. Couple of steps. Good. The drone, Shaking camera. Oh, yeah, the, shot off. Um, <laughs> the drone's got called for um, to get the aerials are all that work doing firefighting. But one of our tasks is we need uh, roof reports or observations to see what's going on. So they put the thing to work, um, which was great. Uh, there's a there's a heap of footage. This is done by from the Inspire one. Um, I went there as the investigator. I didn't go there to, to fly the RPAS. You could think that that's your main area of fire. There isn't. Look at that. That's, that's going like the, you know what? Yep. And the beauty, you can see here, yeah? you've got, actually got active fire down here. The boys may have seen that from here, but if that's, if that's a second story mezzanine, you may not even know there's fire on that mezzanine level. They're not sending the people in. The, the beauty with this is it actually can give us an, an overall <coughs> visual of what's going on. You set a, a platform up here, you're not going to get an observation through the smoke. You're not going to waste aerials just here as an observation tower. It's just a waste of, of uh, resources. So you set that up and you put it to work. There are platforms, I call them platforms or aerials, that you can actually tether to the ground and they'll fly for 24 hours straight. Um, we don't have one of those, but they are out there. They are available. Now the best, oh, as long as the battery can put one, one, is how long they'll, they'll play for. Okay, that's using the infrared uh, camera. So now that's the same building, and you can see the intensity of the heat. You can see that how we've got more intensity down here, but we're cool down here. Right? That's a, a hundred odd metres that way and 70 metres that way. It's a big building. It's, um, it was a 12 foot long that ran for about um, two weeks overall. I think. Yeah, it went for a long time. I think every fiery city went to that job at some stage. <laughs> It's not a fire hit you haven't put out eventually. Yeah. Now, the, the last one to finish so, off... Can you go back to that Shalora? Yep. Yeah, so you... where was your area of origin from your investigation? Ah, I'm coming to that. Oh, okay, sorry. No, oh, you're taking my thunder. Oh. All right. Yeah. I'm coming around this side. As an investigator, what are you noticing that doesn't sort of... that doesn't ring true or doesn't look right? Or it just stands out? Look at the roof, just look at the roof. Yeah, look at the roof. That there. Okay. That's, that there is burning the most. Bruising, the biggest fuel load. Once we got in there, it got into the plastics and the rubber. And remember, this, this is probably, I don't know, an hour and a half after the incident first started. So if, if we go back to that, that, that bit of footage. And freeze it. So, then, um, the fire started here, okay, it started here and it spread really quickly and it went really quickly laterally in both directions. It got into the fuel load there and it changed so they had to concentrate. The first arriving pump arrived here and he saw massive amounts of flame there didn't have the resources and it just spread really quick. But one of the things was that um, I, I got there, you know, obviously we go through all our processes and do our interviews and so forth, and they're going, he, 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 he. I'm looking for my indicators to prove and substantiate it. Um, 
I mean, I've spoken to the owners of the building. Is that roof, the, uh, was that an old roof that had been repaired? It was all the same. Mm. So we know that the, the um, deformation, um, the oxidation of the roof it, it has to be caused. It's the hottest area at some stage. But we know now that the fire's all over here. But this area is still burning in here, quite intense down here as well. So um, to help substantiate my area of origin, that was a good point. Did I get in there and fly the drone inside? No, because it was too hot. No, because this is our old railway workshops, all steel inside, and we just weren't going to waste a $4,000 or $2,000 drone when I, I wasn't allowed to go in and retrieve it. This wasn't allowed to go in there. But, um, and we still had smoke, so we had to work on everything we, we had. We, um, we established through, with, uh, with Greg Kelly's mob came out, um, and we went through the, through the job, we worked out how the fire started, we put it all together, we're quite comfortable with it. Um, and we established that without actually going in and doing our, our point of origin, but we had a, we found our causation. All right. So um, that's it for the for the video footage. Um, and for you guys that have seen them or haven't seen them, this is um, this is the Mavic. So this is our our new toy. I shouldn't say toy. It's a piece of equipment. <laughs> That we use. That's it. It's ready to go. All right. It's got a camera on the front, little 4K camera, which has got a zoom capability. Um, in the past, um, with the Inspires, you've got to put the props on and all the guards. This does have guards that goes with it. In here, somewhere. If my assistant was available, he would have had all this ready for me, but. Forbes is sitting down there. So they just go over the top, it gives you that protection. So that if you are inside and you bump into a wall, all right, you bump into a wall, you're going to come off. These will fold back, but unfortunately, it won't fly on, on three rotors. This needs all four. The bigger platforms, which have eight rotors, you can lose one and it'll keep flying. Um, that's the matrice. But these, these won't fly without it. Um, so that's got about a 20 minute, 25 minute battery life, and um, yeah, and, and that's, that's a lot more stable. So and you find the battery life long enough for the job? I've got five batteries. Oh, okay. So in, in this case here, which is not much bigger than, you know, you put on a backpack, you can go out and, and carry the five batteries and carry the, you know. When I did the fire at Curry Curry, I got a bag this big, and I've got cameras, and I'm lumbering, lumbering, lumbering it through the bush, and it gets very wary, you know, because we had a number of points of origin to deal with. Uh, but now, you can throw this on a backpack. There are smaller ones again, um, Spark, yep. and which is virtually the size of the palm in your hand. You can do all sorts of stuff with these. And I'm not here to sell the, the badges of one of these things, but um, they are, they're, they're great for the kids to play with. Um, so that's the actual the unit. Um, and then you have a controller and a little tablet. You can use a mobile phone, and I have used a mobile phone, but I prefer to use a screen, because the bigger the screen, the better I can see, yeah. and the better or less I'm gonna run into something. So they are really good. Um, yeah, and you record all your footage, and you just download it. Uh, at the scene, I download it, I have a look at it, if I don't like it, I'll put it back up again. And away I go, okay. Um, at a scene, I identify a landing area. I have a, a landing area and an alternative landing area. Before I, um, we were flying, I did a job with uh, another organisation at another location, and I won't name who they are, but they had a landing zone, they took off and flew, and when they come back to land, the plumber had parked in his spot. <laughs> now the thing with these, is that they will come home of their own accord if something goes haywire, and they will come to return to home. It's going to land back on where they're supposed to be. So what I, what I do is I put out some cones, um, and I have a bit of carpet to keep the rubbish off the ground, a yuck of graph will bring the dust and whatever ever up into the gear, and I mark that off. Two reasons, I've got safety. Okay, no one walks in there. Um, I can guarantee you, if you use barrier tape, fireys will go past it, because they have to. So I put the cones out, and, um, and I identify my area. I also identify a second alternate landing zone, because if that's gonna, something's gonna go ugly there, I know I can land somewhere else. And um, yeah. And if you use, if you get in the in the process and you're using someone and you ask them to go and tell somebody that lives in a house next door, do not come out while you fly their drone. Don't use them. Do it yourself. Yeah. 
because I've asked someone else to go and do that, and next thing you know, the old fellow's coming out with his walking stick and he's looking up and I'm flying right above his head, and I thought, this is going to go to CASA and I'm going to get in trouble. But luckily it didn't, because you've got to ensure that that... And that was one of the things we said. We can make sure that the property next door people are home. We're going to fly above it. We have to fly above it. But let them know what we call protecting place. Keep them inside. And if they want to have a sticky bleed, give them that opportunity to come out and have a look at it, but then put them back inside where they're not going to... Something's going to fall on their head. Cool? Any questions? That was absolutely perfect. Anything at all? No? Have you flown through smoke? Uh, yes, unfortunately I did. Um, we're at uh, London Derry, our research facility, and we're doing some test burns, and it went through smoke. It came out okay. Uh, the props got uh, soot all over them. It's got to clean it down. But, you know, like again, <coughs> smoke, it's heat, it's not good for it. And as Richard mentioned about the battery temperature, that's not good. Um, so you lose visual. Technically, that's what I was going to say. If you get on smoke, technically, you don't have visual flight. No. Nah, what well, if you use a the thermal camera? You ain't got visual anyway. Uh, don't have thermal camera on this. We only have the thermal on the Inspires, and we don't have the thermal on the on the Phantom 4. We don't have, the Inspires too big and too heavy. This is all we need. And nine times out of ten, when we're at a job, the smoke's gone, because we're coming in to do the investigation. That's what we're using these for. For operational purposes, like we, you saw at Shalora, that'll be a different set of circumstances. It's then up to the operator to make sure they don't go into that smoke. You know, you, you lose sight of it, you don't know what's going to happen. Yeah. It, could then, it could then play up with the controls, and you could lose it. You just don't want to do that. And trust me, when you lose sight, you imagine this thing at 300 feet. Oh, yeah. You can't see it. You don't see these little lights. And if you all of a sudden think, where are you? Please come home. And you can't see it. Um, trust me, all of a sudden you start thinking, oh, where is this thing? You know? And you try and orientate from the, from the photo. From the but isn't it when you do your licence, I've done the licence as well, like part of the competency is if you actually do just get lost. You can go, what is it called, home lock or something? Hit return to home. Hit. We're not even return to home, like, before all that. You, even before going hit pull that trigger, if you flick it in a certain um, setting, I think it's called home lock or something, you just push back, it will come wherever, it doesn't matter which way it's oriented, it will just come back towards your location. I haven't heard of that. I... It's on a fan, it's on the, oh, I had it on the Phantom yeah. too. Yeah. No? No, there's a return to home button. Is that the only thing, it's a return to home. Home lock. Or you just back well, stick it. You know, you've got all these flicky things on the side of the... I haven't done the license for two years, don't It was part of the confidence. Um, any other... Any, anything else? No, yeah. Batteries. Batteries. How long does it take you to charge your batteries up? Uh, by the time I s cycle through five batteries, the first one's charged again. So what we've done when we've done training, we've just had it set up with a generator, put a power pack out, and as soon as one's down, put it on charge, and we can keep flying... That's why we have the five batteries. So basically, being out of the air is the whole time of bringing down, changing batteries and go. There's a couple other things, and again, I, tonight was just a quick briefing. It's, you really should have two uh, pilots if you're going to do long duration. You can't be intoxicated while you're flying this thing. It's the same rules as flying an aircraft. The chief pilot who's supposed to be sober, while she, even though he's not there, he's supposed to be sober, um, even though he's, he's 200 miles away. Um, you're supposed to have, there's a fatigue management for this. You can't continually fly and fly and fly. You should rotate over. You should have an observer um, where possible. Um, a, a lot of times I will, um, I will just appoint another fiery. You're my observer. Keep an eye on this and keep an eye on the landing zone. Keep an eye on the things where I can't see. So, um, yeah. Have you used dual controllers? So yeah, on the... Um, someone else to take the photographs and the video while you're concentrating on trying to get through it? On the... Um, on the Inspire we have that, on the Phantom we don't, on the Mavic we don't. Now what I'm talking about is three different types of, of air, we call them aircraft, okay? Um, the Inspire's the big Ferrari, um, the Mavic's our new little go anywhere zip zip, and our Phantom's the one I've been using for the last 12 months, which I've done most of the training on, or flying on. Um, we're going to use that as our training aircraft, because it's a nice, stable platform, it comes down, and it's just a good way to start. Start with that, and then move on to this. But this is what all the investigators, We'll be using in the future in one of these. This is what we're getting. We're going to have two of these um, in our unit. So we're just going to make it part of our kit. As I say, it's just another camera. Sometimes we can use it, sometimes we can't. Have you used the um, first person view goggles no. for that? No. Because that might be easier to navigate through tight spots because yeah. it's, it's like you're flying, you're actually sitting on the machine. 
Yeah. But then uh, it's not visual on the side. They're really, really good, are they? Uh, not for external, for, more for the internals. Are they really, really good? Yeah, well, it's like, they're your, really it's good like your writing inside. <laughs> inside, <laughs> inside, <laughs> inside, <laughs> inside <laughs> I love it when the boss is here. Sorry. Sorry, was that my question something? Yeah, the distance they came bushfire fighting, has reduction work, on top of a cliff, it's way down in the valley, you can still see it. A pair of binoculars still see it? Yes, I can. No, no, I, I don't know about that. Uh, I'm just looking, what's the distance between you doing the controlling and the machine? Um, well, it depends on how good your eyesight is. You know, but can you use, you can't use binoculars? I, I haven't had that question asked of me. Yeah, you um, can't. It, it's the unaided, unaided eye. Yeah. Unaided eye? So we, we haven't, we, all we've done from our side of it, from, from <coughs> fire and rescue, as long as we can see it, with our eyes, and we haven't gone in using binoculars. Okay, okay. so what sort of distance, you know, there is way over the larger machine, and it was all fluoro, would you have half a cane? Oh, no, more than that. Yeah? Yeah, yeah. I think a cane? That, yeah, maybe. I don't know, I haven't tried it. I haven't gone there. <coughs> it's a line of sight. It's got to be the, the line of sight. Yeah, I know one or two, okay. Yeah. yeah. Look, I, um, the yeah, Mosfell the other day, I had a distance of 300 metres. Yeah. And, I, and that was with the big one. Yeah. I could see it as clear as a bell. And yeah. it's quite easy to see. That's range. at 300. Till right? the rain came. Till the rain yeah. came. Yeah. 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 I'm going to say this at 300 metres. Yeah. I'm going to struggle a little bit. Because then you're looking at the grey surface up against the blue sky. Is there anything like yellow duct tape? Yeah, that's what I'm going to speak to our, our maintenance guy and say, put, yeah, he's... Um, well, there are lots of them on this. Um, look, technically, as long as you don't tell anybody, um, I'll, I will just crank her up, but um, I'm not supposed to fly. But I'm flying inside. I'm not on the castle rules because I can't fly away, so I don't care. But again, I'm within close quarters and shouldn't fly above people, but I'll just, I'll just bring it and start it and just get it up and over here. All right, are you happy with that? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, any other questions while I get this thing started? Can you see the battery readout from your control? Yeah, yeah, yeah you can. You can see this. The, um, everything's on here. It tells you all sorts of stuff. Um, oh, that's the other thing. I, you can't fly um, above uh, 32 kilometre an hour winds. We've got a little Kestrel, so we put it up. Now remembering this is a mistake that um, I made. I gave Forty the Kestrel and I said, check it, he goes, oh yeah, it's cool, it's all good. But that was on the ground. We got up higher, it was a lot, it was a lot. It was so good. <laughs> <All windy up. laughs> I wouldn't use Forbes. <laughs> um, so a couple of things you've got to be careful of. You've got to make sure your, your machine or your aircraft has got power. You've got to make sure your iPad's got power. You've got to make sure your hand controller's got power. Because uh, they all, they all, they're 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 all, that doesn't work there. So if you sort of <coughs> you see the screen, you sort of see what I'm sort of showing. Yeah. And that's what you're sort of seeing. So you look up, down, around, patches, patches head. That's shine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty silent and right. uh, Red lights at the front, and green at the back. What do you notice about the one at the back? It's only one. No, one working. No, it should be. Flashing. The one at the back. Oh, sorry, yeah, that's right. This machine doesn't have them. Uh, on the other machines, um, they actually have on the uh, prop arms, they have green lights as well. So that it matches the two red at the front and they have two green at the back. So on the other machine, the green light for the battery is in the middle. So you're watching to see what your battery is doing because as that gets um, low in power, it starts to change. So the same reason we can sort of put it that the, um, the lights on the back are green so it matches in with the battery. Otherwise you sort of get a little confused. Do you have any rumours whether they're going to force them to change the proper corporate stuff lights or not? No, I haven't heard anything. 
that might get too confusing if you had which way they went, I don't know. You see now, even now that, that's moving around, <laughs> just with the arm, it's down to up. There's no GPS on that, and it's just, it just wants to... Oh, I'm not going to take it any further, I don't want to have it move or hit anybody or run into anything. You can get a good idea of what it's doing and what you can do. Um, Pretty simple, pretty simple. What a pilot. Put all that money into that. Well <laughs> what, I, what I find that I'm, that the guys who have, have flown, um, I'm happy for them to jump in here. Um, the best, easy, easiest way that I find is fly from the rear. Um, because if I keep the, the thing facing me, I'm not then thinking which way am I going, left or right, up and down, whatever, because I know what I'm doing. So if all of a sudden it's facing you and you go, 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 I want to go to the starboard and you press the starboard, it's going port, hang on, that's not making sense because it's the wrong way. It doesn't orientate to you, it orientates on itself. So I always try and keep it. And when I bring it back and land it, I bring it back and land it rear end in and just bring it down and drop it down at my, to my feet or somewhere wherever I've got it. Um, that's pretty straightforward. Do you agree with that? Totally. Yep. yep. Um, that's it. Any other questions? Like, how close can you get to the high voltage power? <coughs> well, we flew a fire at... Um, oh. No, it's up somewhere up in Curry Curry, and it was at, in, the, in the power. Yep. And I was concerned about getting in close enough, because it worked <coughs> what we believe was a failure by one of the conductors, and I'm, I'm getting too close. And I got told later we virtually can land on top of them. So oh. for, um, for that type of investigation, which was really good, uh, we, are we couldn't get an aerial in there, but we could get the footage of what we needed of the conductors, which is the conductor file, the conductor. Um, and insulator, that, insulator, sorry, insulator file. And insulator. that's very difficult. Once you try and establish that and prove that, and that'd be brilliant. For that. Oh, it was good because we started piecing it all together. We then, we then videotaped down the pole, yeah. and then you can see yeah. the run of the fire and how it behaved because of the topography yeah. and the wind behind it. And, the, and it was just, just excellent piece of gear. Um, so it's, it's really handy. To Apart from wind, I haven't had any trouble on the low voltage type. Yeah. yeah. Well, this was, this, I don't know how high how the power was, I don't recall. Might be 11 kV. Mm -hmm. When you get to the real big ones, um, that one I did with Mick out of Colleton, and um, it was right next to, and I sort of I wanted to stay away because I was concerned we were, had, we were in a flight path, it was in a, a from a Banks Town out, and the, oh, they're above the flight on the feet, of course, but but if that's what I get here and I lose control, this and just flies off in the stress, you know, I'm going to all sorts of trouble. It's a learning thing, it's, it's, a, it's a learning tool. Um, so, anyway. Anything else? No? So, I hope you learned something from it. I hope you got something out of it. Um, there's a lot more to, to, to do with it. Um, if you're going to, just practice and play. And, uh, and just go and fly as much as you can. Thanks. Thanks, Wayne. Thank you for your time. What am I?